and welcome to this episode of Life with Lizzie Lee, powered by the China Project. I'm joined by the great Harry Harding, also known as Haza, a journalist, TV presenter, radio host, and singer previously based in China. So Harry, for those in our audience who are not familiar with your story yet, can you give us a sneak peek into your life? How did you become such a rock star anchor at uh, Guangdong Tai, uh, Guangdong TV or Guangdong Guangbo Tai? And what led you to pack your bags and head back to your roots in Australia finally? <laughs> yeah, well, I wish I was a rock star, but you know, I was a, a presenter for a provincial um, television and radio network in Guangdong province. Um, and I really enjoyed it for, you know, the longest time. Uh, and how I got into that role was really interesting because while I was at university studying Mandarin Chinese, uh, I was posting cover uh, songs to the internet and to Chinese video sharing websites such as Youku, uh <laughs> and also Weibo because at the time that was really sort of the most used social media platform in China. Today I'd say it's more WeChat uh, and some of those videos actually went viral and got uh, a few million hits and you know we're talking about 13, 14 years ago so those were some quite high numbers at the time and then so I went for a, a a trip to China after I graduated. I, after I graduated, I went for a trip to China and I initially went to Beijing, but the airline that I flew on lost my luggage and it was the middle of winter. So I had no winter clothes. Um, and I looked on a map and said, where can I go? That's a little bit warmer. And that was Guangzhou. So I flew down there for a couple of days and a producer from uh, a Guangdong television talk show um, saw from my Weibo that I was in Guangzhou and invited me um to be on his show um and so I went there and they interviewed me about my singing and then after the show was finished um they said to me well we're looking for a new presenter for our channel would you be interested and so obviously I jumped on that chance I thought it was a very interesting opportunity um and so I went back to Australia for a couple of weeks and sorted everything out and packed my bags and then went back over <laughs> to Guangzhou to start this new role as a television presenter. And, um, you know, initially my plan was one year or two years, but that, you know, one year after it, another, it sort of evolved into 10 years and then 12 years. Um, so it was the right place at the right time because, you know, um, this was at the tail end of the Hu Jintao era. So the media environment in China at that time was a lot different. Also the relationship between Australia and China was very good at the time. And so it did feel like I was in the right place at the right time. Um, in regards to why I came home, I'd been in China for 12 years. So, you know, in one regard, I felt like that was a full cycle of the Chinese zodiac, uh, you know, 12 years. It's a, a good time to, to, to close the chapter. Um, also, I was, you know, missing my family, being away from, from family and friends during COVID not being able to fly home. It's it's not a long flight from Guangzhou to Brisbane. It's about seven or eight hours. So I could in the past come home for long weekends and things like that. But, uh, you know, as relatives get older and you want to spend as much time with them as you can, I thought 12 years was enough. Um, and also things had changed in, in China, um, especially in the media environment, things were changing. Um, you know, for people who are familiar with China and especially Guangzhou, I think they would understand that in, in Guangzhou, you know, the media environment in Guangzhou was always a lot more open than in other parts of China, especially further up north, say in Beijing. And so for the longest time, I felt like I was doing something constructive and, and something meaningful um, where I was. But unfortunately, you know, uh, things had changed and that was becoming more and more difficult. So I did have to make the decision and say, you know, for my own well-being and mental health, uh, is this really the right path for me to continue on? And I just decided that it wasn't. So uh, I came back to Australia and I'm, I'm now studying a master's degree in international relations. Oh, wow. um, so, <laughs> so it's a bit of a change, but, uh, and I'm still adapting, uh, but that's basically the gist of it. 
Mm, wow, fantastic story. What a story. But let's <laughs> go back and talk a little bit about Chinese state media. You know, there's so. a lot of resources poured into this uh, whole Jiang Hao Zhongguo Guxi mission, right? Telling China's mm -hmm. story well. But at least to us who, you know, live in live in the, the West, it seems right. like China's message is falling flat consistently. As a mm -hmm. former insider, what do you think makes Chinese state media struggle to get their media uh, to get their message across to the international audience. Well, I don't think there's a a, a simple answer to that, but um, there are some major components that I can talk about. Firstly, I think that the content just really isn't relatable to mm -hmm. non-Chinese audiences, and I think you know for China they're really kind of um, in a grind because, as you would know. For a domestic audience, sometimes the messaging can be a little bit different to what the messaging is um, on platforms for external audiences. But since the internet has grown so prolific and social media, you know, if Chinese media that is external, externally facing, if their messaging is slightly different to domestic uh, messaging, people find that out pretty quickly. Uh, whether it be via Weibo, whether it be via WeChat. And so, you know, I think China has kind of made a decision that even in its external, you know, messaging or, you know, media that is externally facing, they've decided, well, we're not really making much traction with international audiences. So it's important for us to make sure that our external messaging aligns with our domestic messaging so that we don't upset a domestic audience. Um, and also, you know, there are other issues such as sometimes there may be uh, incidents reported in non-Chinese media that are considered very sensitive within China. And so, you know, for the average Joe who does have a little bit of interest in China, they may go to Chinese media um, as their first source because they're thinking, well, this is something that's happened in China. I want to know more. Uh, but then when they turn to these Chinese media outlets, Sometimes, you know, it's radio silence. There's absolutely no discussion. And so that will turn people away as well because, you know, it makes sense if you want to learn about China to go to Chinese media. But if the Chinese media outlets aren't facilitating discussion about certain topics that are trending outside of China, then really, you know, people are time strapped. They've got families. They've got kids to pick up after school. They've got work to go to. Um, you know, you can't expect them really to spend half a day, you know, trying to figure out, you know, the truth to a certain issue via, you know, um, perusing all these different outlets. <laughs> you know, people just want to be able to, in this day and age, go somewhere, get the information that they want and need, and then get on with their lives. And unfortunately, you know, Chinese media sometimes doesn't do that. I think Another issue is you mentioned the Jiang Hao Zhongguo Gu Shi. And I think for some people, it's a little bit of a, a, a confusing concept because does it mean telling China's story well, as in being factual and mm -hmm. comprehensive, or does it mean telling China's story well so that China is seen in a positive light? Or does it mean telling good China stories? You know, there's that discussion. And so I think there is some mixed messaging as well, because obviously, from my own personal experience, uh, I know that there are a lot of decent journalists in China doing or trying to do a really good job um, under the circumstances they're in. But unfortunately, you know, it's difficult for them, um, based on the environment, to really get the information that is needed out there. And one final point is, I think, there really is a lack of human stories. Mm -hmm. I think as people, we all want to know what other people are thinking, what other people are feeling. And it is through that that we relate to people. You know, as someone who's lived and worked in China, I can tell you that, you know, the vast majority of Chinese people that I interacted with are just the same as my friends and family here in Australia. You know, they have the same concerns in life. Mm -hmm. They want the best for their family. They want their best for their kids. You know, they want a better life tomorrow than they had today. But we don't see that through Chinese state media. We see a lot of information about statements from, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the movements of 
of Xi Jinping or, you know, other political leaders, but we don't hear stories of everyday Chinese people. And, you know, it, it, it may just be um, a story about something that seems mundane, you know, a, a hobbyist painter who's, you know, maybe they, what their thing is, is, um, you know, painting, um all the different pokemon <laughs> you know like there are there are really interesting human stories like that that would relate to western audiences but we just don't hear about it because so much airtime is dedicated um you know to those more political things and if i can just add one more point um these days when you tune into chinese state media a lot of airtime and a lot of space in publications is dedicated to being highly critical of the west and so as a as you know someone who um is from the west or you know people in in a western audience they get that at home they get that at home through their own media outlets because there is discussion about policies and government and there's debate you know you, you watch american media and there's always fierce debate about what's going on in the us politically um and so people don't tune in to Chinese media to see that, uh, you know, because they can get that at home. They want to see China. They want to know about China. They want to hear from Chinese people and Chinese state media just isn't delivering that. So that is why I think despite the huge investment, um, you know, in many respects, Chinese state media has failed to gain traction. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all the insights. Super helpful. I wanted to turn to Western media, so-called Western media a little bit. I've been pondering lately on how we in the West might actually be missing out if, if we do not truly understand China. But to be honest, our media's coverage of China can be pretty one-dimensional and simplistic as, as as well. What do you think is the biggest story we are sort of ignoring or overlooking when it comes to China? What is this one really important topic that you feel is not getting enough airtime in Western media? Well, I think it goes back to the human story element. So uh, I think, you know, I also don't like the term Western media because, you know, uh, in China, you always hear about China and the West, mm -hmm. but the West is made up of so many different countries, each with different systems, you know, slightly different values, um, different cultures. And so lumping them all together, I think, you know, isn't constructive. Um, but really, I think that, you know, we are missing that human story element. And I have seen some changes here in Australia. Um, there are some programs that I really enjoy watching um you know from our public broadcaster there's a show every friday night about china and mm -hmm. about chinese pop culture and and um you know we do get a look into those those human stories and i think people crave they they want to see those um i also think there's an issue where on both sides both in in china and you know outside of china in, in the west in western media for want of a better term um both sides tend to focus on the extremes of, of each side. So in China, you know, you'll see some anti-West content, which is sort of taking screenshots of commentators that are saying some very outlandish things and very over-the-top things, and then China uh, sort of rebutting that. And then on, on the Western side, you also see a focus on people in China with very extreme views, very nationalistic views. Um, and I think that does a disservice to mm -hmm. the everyday Chinese person who, you know, like the majority of us, just have pretty moderate views on life in general. Um, and so if you are focusing on the extremes of both countries, um, you know, I think you don't get the full picture. And also uh, I think there is a tendency to um play into you know some of these um i guess accounts or commentators in china uh because they know that if they're going to say something very controversial that it's going to get, gain traction and so sometimes i feel as though western media outlets they do half the job of of this propaganda drive on behalf of china because they are boosting this content they're engaging with this content and you know, if people didn't react to this, you know, the more controversial stuff that's coming out of China, 
that just wouldn't gain traction and you, you know uh, people might change their uh, approach I guess because you know I do follow a lot of Chinese journalists on say Twitter and I, I keep in contact with many people via email and you know there are some journalists that are doing some really amazing work in China they spend a lot of time um, doing investigative journalism and putting together some really fascinating content but it just doesn't get any attention because it's not over sensor, uh, sensationalized or it's not um, <clears throat> you know overly controversial and so I think if we ignore that content and we, we might actually be missing some pretty important messaging <laughs> because I, I do know that there are some very dedicated journalists in China who are trying to get messages out there and they may be doing it in a more subtle way. But if we, you know, just ignore that totally and focus more on the controversial stuff, we might be missing out on, hey, what is what is this story actually trying to say? You know, why was it framed in this way? Um, is this something that we should be asking more questions about instead of listening to the likes of Hu Jin from the Global Times? Um, and so I think perhaps, you know, if we did refocus our energies on those human stories and I guess trying to seek out and engage with people in Chinese media and China in general that do have more moderate views and asking them why and, you know, asking their thoughts on things, I think we would have more of a comprehensive view on China. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to turn to your own life story a little more. Um, I know a few weeks back, you actually made headlines when you reviewed to um, an Australian media outlet that um, about some suspicious encounters you had when you were back in China, basically a couple who you later suspect were connected to uh, the Chinese intelligence uh, approached you with a job offer. I wonder if you can update us a little bit more on that. What's What has been happening since then? So obviously, you know, I'm I'm very passionate about engagement with China. So before the story came out and before the segment was aired on television, I was a little bit apprehensive. I was worried that I might lose a lot of contacts in China. Um, I was worried that uh, people would be upset with me for sharing the story. But, you know, surprisingly, uh, you know, the response, the reception was overwhelmingly positive, mm. not just here in Australia, but <clears throat> also in, in, in China. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, surprisingly, you know, the reception was overwhelmingly positive, um, not just here in Australia, but also back in China. And since then, I've actually had an opportunity to have some really in-depth conversations with a lot of people from, you know, all walks of life, um, whether they're Chinese Australians here in China or people back in, you know, back in China. Um, and it's just been really humbling and, and very nice to see that, you know, a lot of people are still willing to keep in touch with me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most people just expressed empathy, um, which I thought was, you know, um, really, you know, really nice to see. Um and, you know, I think my main message and the main motivation for uh, sharing my story is because I really do think that engagement with China is is important. Um, I just think people need to be aware of, you know, what's out there and what challenges they may face. Um, and also another concern that I have here in Australia is that our foreign interference laws may be a little bit too broad. Um, and I think we really do need to refine them a little bit or provide very detailed sort of guidelines to Australians to say, okay, this is considered illegal. This is okay. Otherwise, at the moment, what I'm worried about is Australians going to China and somehow getting involved in something that is considered illegal without them even knowing, right. you know, because I was in China for such a long time. I, I speak the language. Um, and so, you know, I could pick up on the red flags. I knew um, that this was something that I didn't want to get involved in. Um, but I just worry, you know, people that may be new to China or people that may not um, have, you know, a deep cultural understanding of China or they may not be able to speak the language. You know, if someone comes to you and says, I work for a think tank, um, I'm really interested in engaging your services. And, you know, I mean, being invited by 
someone who's claiming they're from a think tank for a lot of people that's that's a great opportunity you know oh this is great i'd love to do this um it'll look good on my resume <laughs> you know i might learn a thing or two but um unfortunately sometimes you know that may not be the case and i don't think we should um you know uh, what i what i wish for is that australians will give fellow Australians the benefit of the doubt, especially when Australians are engaging in China. And so I think the way foreign interference laws are at the moment here in Australia, I am just worried that, you know, other Australians may get caught up in this um, without knowing the true nature of what they're involved in. And also I think that prohibits people from actually going out there and and experimenting and you know talking to all different people i think that's the strength of australians you know that we go out into the world and we explore and we experience and then we come home and we can share those experiences but um you know if people are going to china and they have to constantly think in the back of their mind well i've got to worry about this and i've got to worry about that um you know that can really be i i guess restrictive um and so my main message that I would really want to emphasize is that I think we need to rethink some of those foreign interference laws and we need to give Australians the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and me coming forward and telling my story, it was just so that people are aware that this is happening. Um, and so people can make informed decisions about who they work with and in what capacity. Uh, because I think it's great that Australians are still going to China. We need more Australians to, to understand China so that we can engage with China constructively. Um, and, you know, I, I just feel more passionate about being involved in this space, in the China-Australia space, since that article came out, just because the response was so overwhelmingly positive and, and people were very supportive. And, you know, it just reinforced in me that, we're all just people at the end of the day, you know, we're all just trying to do the best we can in life. And, um, you know, but I, I will say one thing, um, which I have been reflecting on um, since the, the article came out, because, you know, after the ABC did some investigation, uh, I was able to get more answers than I had before. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I do feel that it's a little bit, you know, uh, contradictory for China to be, detaining a number of Australians in, in China uh, on espionage charges when, you know, I was working for a Chinese state media outlet and I was approached two times um, to, you know, in an attempt for me to engage in espionage. So I, I think that, you know, it saddens me that, that Australians are detained in, in Beijing um, on charges of espionage when <laughs> you know, on the other hand, I went through this. And so, you know, I hope that um, Australians in China can look after themselves, make smart decisions, but also be confident in what they're doing. And, you know, know that being in China is a huge asset to our, our country, Australia, and, you know, um, to the world, if we have non Chinese people, or, or, you know, um, people in the West of Chinese heritage, going to china living and working there studying the language you know it's an asset and we should appreciate those people for doing that fantastic fantastic thank you so much final You're question welcome. of the day uh we don't get to talk to xi jinping in person these days or ever but if you could sit down with you know president xi jinping himself and actually have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with him about you know, uh, the state of media in China, uh, the media environment, which has been deteriorating for a while. What's your game plan? What would you say to, to President Xi Jinping? Well, obviously, President Xi Jinping uh, really likes to emphasize the importance of mutual respect and dialogue. Um, and, you know, I think that makes sense. Dialogue is always important and is always constructive it's always good to hear other perspectives and try to find a middle ground so i i think you know if i was going into a meeting with xi jinping i would take that strategy and i would say you know i think you know the way you think about this is is great but let's apply it to chinese media as well because mutual respect um i think is important and part of that is being tolerant to different opinions and 
you know, I'm under no illusions that, you know, the media landscape in China could change overnight and become more free. But I think, you know, some of the restrictions could be relaxed so that it could facilitate some dialogue and facilitate some meaningful dialogue. Because uh, I think there is an issue where in China at the moment, a lot of blame is being placed on Western media, foreign media for, you know, telling stories about, you know, not telling the Chinese story well. But the fact of the matter is China's story is China's to tell. And so China should take the opportunity to facilitate some dialogue. Um, you know, I would love to be engaged in some dialogue if it were, you know, mutual, if it um, included, you know, the concepts of mutual respect and and dialogue, because, you know, I feel that I have moderate views on China. I feel that, that I have fair views on China. That obviously would include some criticism, but also some praise as well for what China does well. Um, and, you know, if China feels as though Western media isn't doing a good job of representing China fairly, perhaps it should sit down and say, look, this is our story to tell. We have our own platforms. How about we facilitate those discussions? How about, um, you know, instead of spending so many resources and, and allocating so much time to being critical of the West, let's go back to ch telling China's story and let's engage people that know a lot about China, but maybe, you know, they have some varied perspectives. And I think that would be important. Um, and also, you know, um, it has to be win-win as well. So obviously China always talks about win-win outcomes. And so for someone like me today, if I were to go and accept an interview from a, a Chinese state media outlet, for me, I don't think it would be a win-win situation because I would be concerned that my responses would be edited, um, you know, any criticism would be cut out. And then that would, you know, basically tell the world that I don't have a nuanced view on China, that I don't have a fair and balanced perspective on China. Um, so that would be a win-lose situation. You know, Chinese state media would win because they would have those comments praising China, uh, but I would lose because that would damage my reputation. Um, and so I think, you know, um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Um, but, and this is, you know, another thing, dual circulation. So they talk about dual circulation in the economy where, you know, they're trying to um, boost domestic consumption while also engaging with the international markets. Well, perhaps Chinese media could also have a dual circulation mode where, you know, more separation between the domestic um, platforms and, and the foreign facing platforms. And then at least on those foreign facing platforms, if you do want to have a voice heard around the world from China, you know, really, you need to be able to engage people in meaningful discussions, you need to have debates, you need to have some content that is, you know, it's critical of, of what China doesn't get right, because everywhere else we look, you know, whether it be Fox News or whether it be CNN or whether it be Sky News or, you know, all of these different channels, they always have debates and obviously they have their own Li Chang, they have their own sort of um, slant on everything, but there are debates and, you know, there is criticism of, of, of people and politicians and policies and whatever it is. So it's hard for an audience that is used to that to turn on something like CGTN and see none of that. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I would just say to Xi Jinping that, um, you know, you can tell China's story well um, without omitting parts of the story or without ignoring parts of the story. And in fact, the story would probably be told much better if you did allow more of a comprehensive view of China um, and, you know, it may, it may be a risk. It may be risky to, to start doing that. But, you know, if you really do want to make sure that your own platforms are engaging and, you know, are appealing to a Western audience, then perhaps, you know, allowing some more discourse with some more room for disagreement would be a good start.